One Kuro the Artist here, and welcome back to another Ben 10 Breakdown. We're still chucking our way through the two-part pilot. Part 1 may have highlighted a lot of the changes I didn't really care for. Part 2 gives me a lot about what I do like about the show. And one of the biggest draws is, of course, its incredible artistic flavor woven throughout the series. The art style is the most different from the previous three series, sure. But if you take a second to actually look at the show, it's gorgeous. But it's not just the art style, it's the entire composition of the series. The storyboarding and the choreography, the intricate world building, and the sound design? Flawless. One might even say peak. There's so much care put into every piece of the puzzle in Omniverse. I'd go as far as to say it's Cartoon Network's best looking show. Nothing airing on Cartoon Network at the time could even hold a candle to how jam-packed with detail this series is. This isn't a flack on the shows with more simpler art styles. Some shows were made specifically to be scarce on the detail to fit the vibe of the show, and it absolutely works. Not every series is even trying to be Omniverse. They got their own methods to their madness. But I also feel like that's what makes Omniverse special. Even other shows that used a lot of the same crew, primarily Derek J. Wyatt, didn't look or feel as good as Omniverse either. But of course that could also be contributed to the time and improvement, as Omniverse was the most recent one out of these examples. And while modern cartoons are definitely spreading their wings with animation, it doesn't quite hit the same level of detail and care that Omniverse did either. Again, not always a bad thing. Rise of the TMNT for example, is one of the best looking modern shows I've ever seen, in large part of keeping the designs very stylized and easier to draw, allowing them maximum fluidity and expressiveness of the characters. But Omniverse manages to capture that same energy and still keep their characters packed with detail. I try to diversify my vocabulary with these breakdowns so I don't keep saying the word detail over and over, but honestly that is the perfect word for this. Sometimes I sit there and look at these character designs and I'm like, are they really going to have to animate that? And they do! And it looks great. Combined with the sound effects, the score, and the voice talent, each episode contributes to making the series that much more memorable with its creative efforts. I really don't know if a show like this will ever exist again. So let's continue our introductory dive into the world of Omniverse. But first, if this is your first breakdown and you're curious about how my rating system works, there's a detailed description down below along with a link to all my previous breakdowns. But by all means, watch this one first. I'm sure you'll still enjoy it. Also, today's video is my last chance to tell you that we are going to be at most MomoCon next week. I'm going to be doing live drawings every day, so come on up and get one yourself. We're also raffling off an Omniverse hoodie, a limited edition Horus plush, and we have two panels at that event as well. Ash and I are doing Dumb Doodles live, and it's our first time doing this outside of a Twitch stream. So we'd love for y'all to come out and show your support, and possibly win a few prizes. But now, on to the breakdown. The More Things Change Part 2 was written by Matt Wayne, and aired nearly two months after Part 1, on September 22nd, 2012. Ben and Rook continue their pursuit of the gang into Undertown, where they learn of this city that's been living below Bellwood for quite some time. As they both have their own methods of exploring and investigation, they eventually track down the source to be Siphon, Vilgax's old lackey, as the leader of said gang. Meanwhile, Kyber is still looming in the background. I can't believe you're really going to leave. I know this is fast cut just because it's a recap, but the arrangement is funny. Ben's like pleading for them not to go and then they just drive off without saying a word. Can you imagine if the real scene went like that? I can't believe you're really going to leave. God, this music is so good too. I like all of Omniverse's music, but like some tracks are definitely reused noticeably much more than others. So it makes these ones a little forgotten about, but I'm liking them when I hear them. No way. Oh, I just realized this is also part of the main... I'm just gonna call it the Omniverse theme. I don't mean like Omniverse theme song, just like something to call the da 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 Because there's no official soundtrack release, unfortunately. Maybe one day Cartoon Network will bless us with allowing that to be released. But for now, I'm just gonna call it the Omniverse theme. No way. Yeah, see, this is it. So this is our second time hearing it. First time was a very emotional rendition in the pilot. And now, this recap version. No way. 
Show no. There we go. I was actually going to say I'm surprised Kyber isn't in this recap at all. His story doesn't really pick up until later, but they're, they're like weaving him into the plots throughout the first season just so you get used to him and you get familiar with Zed and her powers and all of that. When stuff gets in his face, he goes to outer space, Ben 10. <laughs> an atrocian one of the most commonly recognizable uh background characters there's a whole variety of them <laughs> There's a whole city of aliens down here. Another excellent running shot. Omniverse is really busting these out like nothing. You sound surprised, Ben Dude. I like that uh, Rook's still calling him Ben Dude, and it wasn't just like a one-off joke. Call me Ben Dude. Okay, Ben Dude. But seeing as this is part two of a two-parter, you might not get it without the setup, but then again, I don't know why you'd be watching this without seeing the first part. A whole secret city? Look at Liam going with the parkour. Festina and Bubble Helmet are just kind of running through. But Liam's out here crossing buildings and stuff. This chase scene is probably the most memorable part of the episode, at least for me. See, I'm loving the fact that they have background characters, but they're also sort of like interacting with the plot and, you know, aware of what's happening. From classic to UAF, even when we got background characters, they pretty much just stand there and react or scream and run away. And like, you know, what else are you going to do? That's realistic, but Omniverse plays it up a bit since they're all these fun creatures. They get to really mess around with them. Also, I just noticed Rook doing this wall jump. Good shit. It's such a uniquely built city, too. You can tell it was very thrown together without an actual, like, layout plan of what all these buildings are. They kind of just built the building as as they went and expanded under town <laughs> always loved that shot too the scene of busting through the window and we follow her through a flash and then swings on over i like that sound too the clinking oh yeah this is where the music picks up this is another track that gets like forgotten about as the series goes on i think they use it a handful of more times but like this is the only time i really remember it being there like significantly <laughs> So I feel bad for the citizens that live there. Accelerate can catch those scuzz buckets. Outside of Heroes United, this is the first time we've seen 16-year-old Ben try to transform into Accelerate. Since gaining all of his old transformations in Ben 10,000 Returns, we've never really seen Ben expand outside of his UAF repertoire. Except for like, you know, Cannibal and Upchuck and all the, the extras, but... Despite it being a mistransformation, as we see, it's still cool to hear Ben like name drop him and talk about him. I also like that the momentum causes NRG to slide a bit. <laughs> So disgusted with mistransforming, he just spits on the ground. Great manners, Ben. What happened? No on it. Still learning the controls. It's cool to see Ben have to explain mistransforming to other characters. <laughs> I love this quick shot too. A lot of really great uh, effects with Rook's proto tool that we see throughout the pilot. <laughs> what is this though? It's like a heat seeking uh, energy blast. <laughs> I don't think he ever uses that again. That was awesome. But Liam's tumbling animation, like, I, I can't spend every single breakdown complimenting every single animation, despite how, like, fantastic it is. So as we go through this, I'm going to try to dial back on just being like, oh, that's cool. But I mean, we're still on episode two of Omniverse. It, we should be able to appreciate all of the new artistic methods and details put into the series. <laughs> so even the fact that, like, his, his lighting changes slightly just for this electricity. <laughs> Oh, this. That's what he shot. Yeah, this this just kind of disappears. I don't think we've ever seen this again. Nice going, Rook. For a newbie. You also hear a, a, an echoing sound for NRG since he's inside of the suit. Yeah, for a newbie. Omniverse also goes very hard on the vocal effects for the aliens. Sometimes a bit too hard, but like 80% of the time, it's great. Who is behind these alien shape <laughs> So the splitting screens, we got this a couple of times in Classic, but now it's brought back for Omniverse. And the border for it is this jaggedy black black line. I love that. They never flack when they have a chance to go the extra mile. You took out my brakes! This guy right here is Toby Monitor, voiced by Rob Paulson. He's just an undertown citizen, but you know, he's got a name and he shows up a lot. Actually, almost all the undertown citizens have a name, even if they don't have a voice actor. You probably only actually hear maybe like 20 or so of them name dropped compared to like the 70-ish aliens there actually are. But that makes more fun for like outside of the show, like learning all of the names of the background characters and what they are and how their lives are and stuff. <laughs> 
This is one shot right here. They don't just slide by. All the characters turn their heads to react. Things get knocked over. Dust gets kicked up. The signs shake. Like, incredible. Look at this guy's tongue. I, I honestly feel confident enough to say that artistically, this is probably the most visually intricate show on Cartoon Network of all time. I genuinely can't think of a single show that puts this much time and care and dedication into every minor detail. If you can comment down a show that you think it could compete with Omniverse, not just art, like art design alone, I'm talking like the world building, the way the universe works, like the sounds, the animation itself, like even all the way back here, nothing that doesn't have detail. These two fruits right here have texturing differences, like there's nothing like it. I feel like there's never gonna be anything like this ever again. <laughs> Rook gracefully lands as NRG smacks down. <laughs> See, even right here, each one of these random background characters have their own sound design. They all move differently. They're even voiced too. See, I didn't even notice that this thing was CG until it started moving. Hey! You don't have brakes! Bumper's still figuring out his official voice for Rook in this episode, and yet again, he's still using contractions. Hey! You don't have brakes! See, if you got like season 8 Bumper coming on and to read that line, you would read him in his much higher, cleaner register. I have fought Tokustars and Incursions, Tetramans and Ectonorites. That is Ben Tennyson, and I am no beast, sir. <laughs> See how they're all moving too? I'm, I'm gonna be here forever. I can't believe this place. Even this little guy right here just walking by, you hear him trickling on by. I can't believe this place. I can't either, Ben. Like, wow. Let's look around. And here's Kyber. And this flashlight. Like, what more can I say, honestly? Just like, did they really have to put in the extra effort to make this unique design for a flashlight? No, but they did. Kyber now exclusively whistles with his jowls. In the pilot, he did both his mouth whistling and his jowls, but from this point forward, he just flexes his little gills here or whatever. And that's how he commands Zed. It's not always to get Zed to transform, but see, he just whistles and calls her and she comes running. There's a boy. Kyber also doesn't know that Zed's a girl. Now he investigates the molten loogie that NRG spit earlier. So he pretty much just spit so that Kyber can find this. Half melted, hunt him up. Oh, this time he didn't even whistle. She just did it. And this is an interesting transformation. She's like struggling to get into this form. Maybe she's not quite used to the Nemetrix device yet. But Zed's transformations always look fantastic. You see the new body parts form in. She grows a second eye on each side. The color changes. And even the design itself. Like this looks like a pain to animate. But here it is looking as crisp and as beautiful as ever. <laughs> This is not just a, a visual effect. This is drawn to be warped around in the glass. You can tell because of the thickness of the outlines is consistent. So somebody had to sit there and figure out what Ben's head would look like warping around a glass like that and draw it. But when these characters walk by, this big pink thing and Rook, this is just a visual effect. They just add a little spherical lens effect to it. I know I'm the new guy, Ben Dude. Yeah, wow, he uses so many more contractions than I realized. Call me Ben. Now the audio engineers are just showing off. Shouldn't we go? And Rook is unable to understand the word by word emphasis that Ben is doing and is just trying to mimic his speech patterns. You get a lot of that with Rook, but they eventually phase Rook out of always being ignorant once it starts getting old, which I appreciate because like the longer Rook is around Ben, the more he learns like human culture and terms and mannerisms and whatnot. But right now he's still very ignorant to them. How long do you suppose there's been an Undertale? Probably since Earth became an open system. That probably happened because of Ben since he's started making the news in the classic series. Tentacles on a stick, so fresh they grab you. I love the tentacle vendor. Also voiced by Mr. Johnny D. Now he's a strange case though, because he's another very significant background character who shows up a lot and has his own voice, but he doesn't have a name. He's just tentacle vendor. Let's see, I'm gonna call him Roy. I don't know why, but Roy just fits. So for now on, tentacle vendor is gonna be known as Roy to me. Oh, and the tentacles as well. They have their own shading, shine, and they're flexing and moving. Actually, it's strange that they do that since they're chopped up. I wonder what species this comes from. I know there's certain like seafood dishes that they still move around even after they're cooked and served for a variety of reasons, like muscles being triggered and such. But this like seems like they're alive. I'm finally that hungry. Give me one of those. Hell yeah, Ben. I would try it too. Plumber's working a case. Rook's got a normal ass wallet though. That's funny. I don't know nothing. I don't see nothing. I love how the community of Undertown is very anti-police, even though it's the plumbers. It makes a lot of sense because a lot of them are probably hiding out on Earth illegally, so don't know, don't tell. 
red spot plumber. The first canonical acknowledgement that their logo is the red spot. So that's like a slang term for plumbers now are the red spots. Why'd you have to go and show your badge? I may have misjudged. Ah, oh, poor Rook. He's just following protocol. He doesn't really get like the nuances of how these people operate. Even Ben, who just found out this place existed, already knows like, don't be flashing your badge. People don't like that. Don't stress. I'm the one who skipped breakfast. Between part one and part two, there's like this passive narrative about Ben trying to find food. First, he skips out on Mr. Smoothie because he misses Gwen and Kevin. Then passes on Max's food because, you know, it's Max. Then is interrupted by the gang right when he's about to finally eat at Bauman's. Technical vendor just dipped. Bro's just trying to grab some grub. This is my first time away from home. When I first became a plumber, I was assigned to my home planet, Ravana. Now that's an interesting bit of information about Rook that I kind of forgot. This is his first time being off world. Because even when he was a plumber, he was still on his home world. Later on, he does bring up sharing a classroom with the Vredals though, or at least taking a test with them. So did the Vredals have to go to Ravana for their training? And if Ravana is such anti-technology, why is there a plumber base there? I don't know. Maybe he's just speaking in terms of like his assignments and stuff. Like he probably went to a plumber satellite to train, but then still had to come back home. So I guess he didn't consider the plumber academy actually leaving home. Whereas this, this is right there in the field. The most exciting thing to do there is keep rodents out of the grain silos. And we'll actually see that later too when we go to Ravana. The rodents run fairly large. That they do. I wonder how early they knew they were going to go to Ravana. I assume they knew they would eventually, but I like that they're seeding in how Rook was raised this early, where it's not like 20 episodes later and Rook's like, oh yeah, this is my history. Like they knew right out the gate. This is who Rook is. This is how he was raised. This is where he comes from. So it's very well thought out. So Zed over here is now Bug Lizard, another one of the Predators. I think Stinkfly's Predator, but is not in combat. So perhaps Bug Lizard here just has better tracking skills. That's the reason to become this transformation. I really do think we should continue look- A quick little mistake here though. You see this background character has a red sleeve and a yellow arm right here, who is another common background character. But in the very next shot, he's colored purple. His shirt kind of reminds me of Max's a bit. Relax. Look at these multi-armed purple chickens. Pretty soon the big bad will say, Ben Tennyson, here to ruin my plan? It's funny because that happens so much in Ben 10 too. This isn't just like an introductory line to set the stage of how Ben's world is. Like we've seen villains do that time and time again. But also right here, it looks like Rook's uh, layering is a little bit messed up. His arm is clipping halfway through his torso right up until he turns for this frame right here. Can I ask you some questions? This is actually a adolescent Lepidopteran right here. He's going to be meeting his predator pretty soon. Hope that doesn't traumatize him. And see how different of a shape this is with Stinkfly? It's not like they're just taking Stinkfly and swapping around his proportions. This is an entirely different body type, but because the essentials are there, the four eyes, the wing colors, and the tail, you can tell it's a Lepidopteran. Omniverse is very, very good at diversifying its body types. Well, at least with the male characters. We'll, we'll talk about the females when... You'll see. Knock yourself out. Hey, here's Roy right here. I guess he just is going for a stroll now. Here you see this balloon come to life and actually give Rook some instructions. So to Ben, it looked like Rook was being crazy just talking to his balloon, but Rook actually recognized that this was a sentient being. So Rook is much more observant than Ben's giving him credit for, despite his seemingly dim-wittedness compared to his knowledge of Earth culture. Tube socks, scrunching pairs. We got the tube sock vendor here, voiced by Yuri Lowenthal. Another one without a name, though. I was just given Omniverse props for naming all of its background characters, but I guess we're coming across the rare times they aren't named. I'm gonna call him Nusky. That's socks in Russian, or at least according to Google. And we got Kinocellarins, Accelerate Species, who Ben tried to become earlier. I love the double stripe on this one. The mother right here is Tatum, and this little girl right here is Emily, and they're both voiced by Tara Strong. I got a bloody nose! Just a joke about how aliens eat weird stuff. Now, in the classic series, it was said somewhere that the helmets are biologically a part of them. But here with these Kinocellarins, they each of them aren't wearing a helmet. Unless you consider these helmets, I don't really know what they are. But it does disrupt a little bit about what we previously known about Kinocellarins. It's also worth noting that their names are spelled the same as Accelerate with this acronym style naming uh, procedure that Ben uses for Accelerate and NRG. So it's almost like Ben had like the intuition to know to name his alien Accelerate in the same fashion that these characters are. Well, did you expect me to cook it for you here? Yeah, you can hear Tara a little bit in both of their voices. But funny enough, it's already immediately relevant. So despite a lot of Omniverse characters having very diverse body styles, a lot of the female aliens all kind of have the same. They're a lot more like humanly feminine and voluptuous compared to how wide they go with the males in different species. Not all the time, but like noticeably much more for the females than the males. It'd be like if all the males just had the typical like tall, strong guy, muscular physique. But after a while, it goes like, why 
why does every female have like a massive rack? And with the human females too, especially, like they also have very similar shapes. Get your protozoan smoothies. Oh, that's a cool voice filter. Get your protozoan smoothies. It sounds like they reuse the exact same audio clip for that. Get your protozoan smoothies. Get your protozoan smoothies. Yeah, they did. This smoothie vendor is voiced by Bumper Robinson, whose name is C. Horsipede. <laughs> There you are. Oh, that's so creative, but disgusting. <laughs> Here's Bug Lizard. It's hero time! Hey, yes! I almost forgot he even says that. So here he selects Humongousaur. By the way, I feel like I've done so many of these breakdowns, I shouldn't have to say this, but perhaps there's a lot of new viewers. So for one, welcome to the channel. But also I got a lot of comments last video where people were pointing out that Ben selected Spider Monkey, even though he wanted Humongousaur. Humongousaur! so that shouldn't count as a wrong transformation. The way I do it is if Ben wants to become something and he doesn't, then it counts as a mistransformation. The method and means don't matter. I'm just surprised how many people felt the need to point that out. But I mean, thank you for being invested in, you know, trying to correct a potential mistake. But bottom line, the mistransformations count if Ben doesn't get what he asked for, regardless of how it happened. But here, this is straight up a mistransformation because you do see him select Humongousaur. I just wanted to get that out of the way while I had a second. <laughs> Now we get Water Hazard. Cool idea to put it in the reflection. Now Water Hazard is one of my best examples for Omniverse making fantastic choices to their redesigns. When people ask me which alien is an improvement in Omniverse over any other series, the very first one I think of is always Water Hazard. Oh, why can't I ever get Humongousaur? That rippling in his voice is a nice touch. Water Hazard. It's not quite gurgling, so it's still very easy to understand, but it's enough to like make him sound more alien. <laughs> And another beautiful running animation. Bug Lizard's actually not that big compared to some of the other things Zed can become. I don't need to. That's such a big space between words. It sounds like Bumper is saying that line as if he's expecting to be cut off. Allow me to. Like with that too. But he doesn't get cut off for like another like three seconds or so. I got this. And that's because like they want to show Rook pulling out his proto tool and getting ready. But he should be saying that as he does it. So the cutting off makes sense. But if I were to remove that part, it would be. Allow me to. I got this. See, now it actually sounds like he's being cut off. Allow me to. I got this. And here's the original again for comparison. Allow me to. I got this. Yeah, see, there's just way too much time in between that. Ugh, <laughs> oh, good stuff. Man, Omniverse really tries to make Ben seem like he sucks at his job, though. Every single fight he's been in so far, he's taken L's. Except for Zombozo, but that was mostly Kevin, not gonna lie. I wouldn't want to interfere. Interfere! Yeah, if you didn't see any of the series prior, you would think Ben legitimately just sucks at being a hero. I love this, too. It's like the net that he has from earlier, but wraps around the mouth and chomps him down. I used that in 5YL just because I liked this tool so much. Nice shot. Here you can see the colors are inverted, but then snap back to how they should be next frame. Two against one. The odds are becoming a bit unsporting. Cabra's like, this is not what I signed up for. I love that you see Water Hazard silhouette crossing through the smoke, but then when Ben finally pierces through the veil, it's him. See how this works? Whoever sent that monster to kill me, he's the big bad. I mean, he's right, but he's not the big bad that's in charge of the gang that's shaking down these shops. They still don't know that there's two different plots happening at once right now. My investigation turned up a lead. So cool thing, this guy was shown in Secrets of the Omnitrix. So similar to what UAF did where they tried to reuse aliens from the previous series to fill up space, Omniverse does that as well. But I think his positioning is a little off. I think he's supposed to be running up this coil right here because right now he's just running up nothing. Yeah. The gas house. Use the pyramid entrance. That's poison gas in there. Ready? Uh -huh. Hell yeah, you can't keep Rook down. <laughs> I didn't realize there was multiple bars in Undertown. I know that they have the black hole, but I guess they got two. Will you cool it with a badge? Tara Spin over here is now voiced by Bumper Robinson, so it gives him another chance to talk to himself. This is one of the changes that I really agree with. I did like D. Bradley Baker's portrayal, the Tara Spin voice for him, but this one's more unique. Will you cool it with a badge? We are not cops. After also NRG, Water Hazard, and now Tara Spin, we're getting a lot of aliens that debuted in Ultimate Alien specifically in this episode. Could be 
reach, but I feel like that's on purpose. Just to give more familiarity to fans who came from Ultimate Alien coming into this show. They get a lot more things they recognize since there's a lot of changes already. So this is their way of going like, hey, see, don't worry. We still remember the old shows happened. They're still relevant. They're still canon. We're just trying to do something different now. <laughs> Yeah, suffocate them, Ben. I'm a superhero. Also forgot that Bubble Helmet is pink. When he has the, the Bubble Helmet on, he has a blue tint to him, but this is what he really looks like. Nice hangout. So, who's behind those shakedowns? He's literally torturing him right now for information. Just remember that. This happened. Uh, I'll tell you as soon as I can breathe. Bad guy or not. Jesus, Ben. That's a fair bargain. <laughs> Come on, Rook. No sympathy for the bad guys. What you doing? Jetpack too? I swear, Bubble Helmet stops using all of his tech in later episodes. This is a great transition animation into Terra Spin's spinning form. And Rook hops onto his back. Reg show. Yeah, that's definitely a regular show reference. Talked a little about some previous ones in the last breakdown if you missed it. You've never dealt with actual bad guys before, have you? All right, for one, Terra Spin is gigantic. It's cool that his head pops out of the upper part of his shell when he's spinning, though. UA didn't do that. But is this background CG? That's impressive. I've read about them in books. You can even see him breathing into the mask. It's fogging up from him talking. Seriously, what other Cartoon Network show is this detailed? Even this quick little reflection shine as he flies through. And his body is acting like a flashlight flying through the tunnels. Here's a pickaxe alien. These usually work for Volcanus. I think this is our first time seeing one without Volcanus. And you see them putting together all of these bombs that were previously shown in the last episode. The stuff that blows up other buildings. And here's Thunderpig. He becomes more important later on too. This guy right here is named Tummy Head. I'll give you five guesses why. He's also voiced by Rob Paulson. Rob Paulson's been around since the classic series, but he gets a lot of roles in Omniverse. Fear is my currency. Fear is my currency. That's actually a pretty badass line. Also, if you couldn't already tell, this is Siphon, Vilgax's old lackey who's returning in Omniverse, still voiced by D. Bradley Baker. He's also another one who I think looks incredible in Omniverse. He's super cool. My reputation will be made once the whole city fear the name. Ben oh, everyone's gonna be fearing Ben 10 if he keeps suffocating his interrogates. <laughs> I love this shot from inside the abandoned bus. Not just the detail, but the way it's curved, and it's a it's a good choice for a shot to keep things unique. Nice. So these are all members of Siphon's gang. There's quite a few pickaxe aliens here. Must have cut a deal with Vulcanus. It's also interesting to note that every single one of them is drawn independently. Even though like these three and these two are the same angles, you can tell based on the small details, their individual drawings. This is actually one where I feel like they should have repeated them. Like I admire the extra effort, but they easily could have gotten away with just copy pasting them. Boatload of those shakedown machines. That is quite a lot. Enough to fill a boat. Here to ruin my plan. Siphon! My investigation led us right to your big bag. He's right. And Rook's a little smug about it too. Like, he's not well versed in Earth culture, sure, but he's not exactly a stick in the mud. He can be a bit smug too. You were always like Vilgax's third toughest lackey. First would be Kevin, second would be Six Six, for those wondering. I'm not counting Albedo because they were more of on equal partnership. And while the same could be said for Kevin, Kevin really did kind of submit to Vilgax's will a lot more than Albedo did. Kevin was far much more of a lackey to Vilgax than Albedo. Underestimated me. Yeah, who wouldn't? Man, Ben just does not care. I love it. You let Ben Tennyson write to me. Thank you. It's super quick, but you see this go into his arm and the device closes up instead of it just like popping out of somewhere. Love that animation. Thank you. You must have wondered what ever became of me. Not even a little bit. No, some might feel this is a bit relying too heavily on information from the previous shows, but like you could easily be meeting him for the first time and you get it. This is some guy who worked with one of Ben's old foes back in the day and now he's trying to make a name for his own. And Ben is obviously not threatened by him. Like everything you need to know about Siphon is right here. Despite him being a returning character from like two series ago. A servant. Now I am master. Siphon's got that daddy energy. Get them boys! Rook out here with his ninja skills and Ben dodging all these lasers as humans do. Come on, work for once. So you actually hear Ben selecting the holograms. Listen closely. Work for once. But you don't see it so they forgot to throw that in there. <laughs> 
Yeah, another Andromeda alien. I, this can't be a coincidence. They should have threw Amphibian in here somewhere too, just to make sure all the Andromeda 5 are in there. Just wrecking stuff. Now, did you see that? That's a cool use of his power. So he picks it up with his hand and he doesn't throw it. His piston shoves forward and ejects it out of his palm. So opposed to like a throwing motion, it's like a... So that's a great use of his powers. Like Omniverse doesn't just change the aliens' appearances. Sometimes they really finagle their abilities too. <laughs> so good that's so good i don't think there's supposed to be two of these guys though they're not just like pickaxe aliens where you could sprinkle them in this is like an individual being but i could be wrong but i was under the impression this is just one guy <laughs> same with this guy here too but there's two of him i don't know it doesn't really matter i guess <laughs> boom see he does it again right here he just grabs onto him and his piston pumps them forward it's such a cool new use of his powers let me break it up for you now, funny enough about Armadillo's voice, so Armadillo's DNA source, Andreas, was voiced by John DiMaggio. Argit is Andreas's friend. Now, Andreas ain't Argit. But then when Ben unlocks the form and becomes Armadillo, he's voiced by D. Bradley Baker. Can't let you hurt him, Kevin. He was showing off. But here in Omniverse, he goes back to being voiced by John DiMaggio, just doing his Andreas voice. Better yet, let me break it up for you. I think Johnny D's a better fit for Armadillo. Drillo anyways. Two thunder pigs too. That has to be an error. Like there can't be two thunder pigs, can they? Forgive me. I haven't any witty remarks. It's such a rook thing to say. Don't force it, rook. That's like the first time Ben's legitimately trying to coach rook too and it's about shit talking. Let the wise crack come to you. Rook will be like I remember the first time Ben took me seriously and decided to teach me something about heroics. It was all about trash talking. <laughs> Ooh, who threw that? Siphon? Man's got super strength now. Ben and Rook were wiping the floor with his whole gang, but Siphon's out here chucking these things one-handed, busting Armadrillo through the wall. He's got some upgrades. Now that's a cool looking device. Now this is really cool to see, because not only is this a unique weapon to shoot him with, but because Armadrillo is obviously one of the more mechanical, robotical looking aliens, it's hard to imagine them being a legitimate species, or like at least this just being an organic creature wearing armor. But this right here with the veins pulsing through his forearm, it shows that yeah, the, even the shell itself, this is part of his biology, and it's causing him to uncontrollably use his powers. <laughs> Yeah, Omniverse is full of these uh, pinch blurs, that, that's what I call them, where you select a point somewhere and then a radius of blurs is created, all collecting at that point, usually just for a quick emphasis, like, <laughs> boom, you see that? But this episode is littered with them. Not in a bad way, though, just like in a noticeable way, because like UAF like barely did that. Tennyson is my... Oh, yeah, and all of this stuff right here, this is like an excessive amount of detail, and it's like off to the side. Most people are looking at Kyber, they don't even see all of this shit. And the bricks just aren't like there as a texture, like the bricks protrude out and change the shape of this structure. Like this whole structure is irregularly built, but that's what makes it look cool. My exciter beam has overloaded your nervous system. That's what I tell my wife. <laughs> Now this is cool too. Normally you see it either in English or in alien language, but here it's like when you go somewhere and you see a sign and it says like the sign, you, primarily in Spanish, at least in America, like you'll see a sign and you'll see a Spanish translation underneath. And then sometimes like other areas that are more populated or full of diverse communities, they have multiple translations under signs. And this is an example of that. A translated sign, it's like, it's so simple, but I just, I love this. This is a very great addition. Also, yeah, it looks like the Flash logo. I see it. Fuck the speed force. That's a smart move. I'm glad that worked. Ben's willing to electrocute himself just to disrupt the exciter beam's effects. That's a pretty brave thing for Ben to do. But I have so many sensations left. So since these aren't just on top of him, all of these additions are like into him. I think Siphon's a cyborg. Either that or this is just one of those scenarios where like animated shows don't care. It's not quite hammer space, but like, you know, when things can just exist inside of a space where it shouldn't. But right down to Siphon's like digitally enhanced voice. I'm pretty sure he's a cyborg. Oh, Bug Lizard's back. Man, Ben's all messed up from this. This is like one of the rare times Ben getting electrocuted actually affects him outside of the scene it happens in, and I like that. It makes it seem like it, it actually mattered, he just shocked himself. His design, sure, but like the way he's acting, he's all phased out and ditzy and out of energy. 
sake, call your dog off. He's not mine. And now it's established that everything that has to do with Zed has nothing to do with Siphon's gang. So concludes this plot, at least for what it is, while also setting up like Kyber is looming in the background. Oh. Get him, Rook. Is it Amphibian? Please be Amphibian. Oh man, they could have had the full Andromeda 5. But I guess they got to show off the new aliens, so I get it. Shock Squatch! <laughs> okay! So Shock Squatch here is still voiced by David Kay, first debuting in Heroes United with a vastly different appearance. David Kay is now also giving him a Canadian accent, which, I mean, sure, why not? Now, I like this design. I talked about the comparisons during my Heroes United breakdown, so y'all know that I like Heroes United's version more just because it's super different. And I was very thrown off by this bright yellow yellow. In fact, I still kind of am. And like, you know, the lightning eyebrows is a bit, I don't know, but it, it's a cool design. And when you see him in action, you'll see how great it is. <laughs> see how he's like interacting with the background as he's flying around. He's bumping into these walls, which breaks down this water pipe. And then the water starts spilling out and Rook runs right through it too, cutting straight through the water. It really feels like where they are matters. They're not just in some random warehouse just as a backdrop. Yeah, Rook. Look at these intense lightning effects. This is a great frame. Shocks with every single punch. You see the blur come in from the background to emphasize it. It does feather around the edges a little bit though. You'll see here and here. It can't blur past what's already there because when it's blurring, it's taking a little bit from what's before and after each vector point and blending it together. So with the edges, you do see like these little lines show up. I get this problem all the time in Photoshop. <laughs> Ooh, look at him go. I will pry it from your lifeless body. Man, Siphon's like legit threatening right now. Usually Ben Hen has the issue, and I'm talking all four series, where they take a very threatening and interesting villain and dumb him down to a one-note joke character. Happened to Dr. Animo, happened to Zombozo, even Vilgax if you want to go there. I know some people disagree with that, but Siphon, they flipped the script. They took the one-note jokey villain and made an absolute G, and I am here for it. Not so green that I let a tunnel collapse on me. I believe that was my first wisecrack. Man, how could you hate Rook? You can't hate Rook. No breaks. Oh, that sucks. Toby still has to work with his screwed up car. Well, it's still the same day, so he probably didn't have time to get it repaired, but I'm surprised it's back on the road. It didn't even work though. Man, stop screwing with Toby's stuff. I swear they've done this leaping forward shot of Bug Lizard like three times already. He's like vomiting out the lightning. All right, he cooked it. And that's a strange D transformation. You hear the clock already ticking down, so he's gonna change back no matter what, but he still presses the Omnitrix dial. But it's cool to see him like collapse into his human form. I made a wisecrack. And Ben's actually proud of him too, because he taught him that and he's recognizing Rook's genuinely trying to not only win Ben's respect, but learn too. So I feel like this smile is Ben acknowledging, maybe I can make a difference with this Ravonagander. So just outside of Bellwood, we have this little creek here in this ship hiding out in the trees. Kind of reminds me of Gantu's ship during Lilo and Stitch. Oh yeah, and Kyber's ship full of all of his trophies. So Kyber defeated a Chrono Sapien, which honestly isn't that impressive until after Omniverse. Omniverse really starts showing you how powerful and diverse Chrono Sapien's abilities are. But just based on from what we got from UA, it's like, yeah, you could probably take one out. We got a Vulpamancer pelt, an Apoplexian skeleton off to the side here, a Terra Spin shell. This sword and this hook are references to Transformers animated. I'll throw in the references during the editing, but right now I, I don't know their names. A crack Dozer head, a big skull right here, a Vaxasaurian skull, and then an ultimate Vaxasaurian helmet. Now, there is a toy out there that shows a Vaxasaurian wearing this helmet, and it was said by Derek that these are like regular helmets that Vaxasaurians wear, which could be true, but then that makes the fact that like Humongosaur evolving into ultimate Humongosaur and gaining that helmet, I'm just gonna say it, I hate that. I don't like that at all. I like the, the theory that because there's sentient ultimates out there, thanks to the ultimate sacrifice episode, that Kyber 
hunted down the ultimate Vaxasaurian and kept part of him as a trophy. Because for one, it shows off just how much of a skilled and daring hunter that Kyber is, despite it being very tragic for Saul. And for two, it just makes sense. Like, I don't know, I just really don't like the idea that like a Vaxasaurian would evolve into like naturally wearing a helmet of its base species. That's just, that's so stupid. Get some nice close-ups of all the stuff here too. He's sharpening his knife. Another great transformation right there. Now, here's something that just came to mind. Maybe some of you would find this interesting. If you were looking to save time and energy and budget on assets and whatnot, Zed transforming to and from Bug Lizard is always shown from the side in this episode. So what you potentially could have done is taken this shot right here, like all of the frames of Zed specifically, not Kyber in the background, just Zed's layer. And then for this shot, flip it around and play it in reverse. And it probably still would have worked, but this was custom animated because the transition back to Zed is very smooth and lasts much longer and is more intricate with uh, the details. Whereas here, it's quicker and Zed struggles to get into the bug lizard form. But, you know, there, there was potential to reuse that animation in that way. And uh, honestly, that's probably what I would have done. But I mean, props to reanimating this again just for this shot. But this Ben Tennyson is more powerful than I imagined. Again, Kyber keeps saying that, but they're really not doing a good job showing that. that. That's the one thing I'm not liking about these episodes is Ben is not nearly as skilled, capable. I, I don't want to say powerful, just but like he's really not doing that good of a job, period, especially compared to the previous series. And Kyber's like so impressed by his skills. And it's like, are we, are we seeing the same things here, Kyber? Kyber the Huntsman. I too say my name to myself dramatically. Now we see him getting arrested. Yeah, tell it to the Arbiter! Rob Paulson in another role as Patalide. We mentioned him last episode. And right here, she becomes more prominent too. This is Molly Gunther. She gets a voice in a bigger role later on. Now, how'd you like your new partner? He fights okay. I mean, based off these two episodes, he fights better than you. Kind of a hole though. Maybe it's somebody else's turn to be the hole. I know you haven't eaten yet. And the food plot comes full circle. Good writing. Chili fries. And that wind's been over. Partner. Looks like the Kinecellarins didn't have their names yet. You know, this episode was much better than part one. I know it takes both parts for a two-parter to make a full story, but often in Ben 10, the first part is better than the second part. And I also rate them as individual episodes anyways, because sometimes they air that way. But I feel like this episode definitely deserves a five in a plot. Part one did the heavy lifting with all of the setup. It also focused a little bit on the malware stuff. Had to say goodbye to Gwen and Kevin. Had to get you used to the world of Omniverse. There, there was a lot of distractions, but never necessary distractions from the meat of the episode from like what's the actual plot what's the adventure that's happening what narrative are we following in this episode it does it great it's very easy to follow but there's enough things happening weave throughout it so it doesn't feel too generic and standard and like other episodes that are similar to this but have also gotten a five it's not the fact that this is the most crazy insane most unique plot but they took their story and they maximized its potential i think it was written very well i think this really wins you over on how undertaking town is, how Rook works. It doesn't feel quite as ridiculous as Omniverse sometimes can. Characterization, it's only going to get a three. They're still figuring out the newer characters. And also this isn't really like a character centered story. So even Ben himself, even when he's written well, he's still just kind of like coasting through with his characterization. So it gets the job done, but nothing really stands out. And everybody else is just, they play the roles that they need to. Visuals, importance, and entertaining all score a five. I think I've made that pretty clear in the breakdown itself so we're gonna wrap up the ratings pretty quickly this time around with a 23 out of 25 Omniverse started out relatively strong. It's definitely a lot to get used to, but if you can look at it for what it is, this is a pretty quality episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Now, let's check out the final thoughts. So like I said in the last video, a significant amount of Omniverse's designs are based on references. And we got another one today with Shirley Partridge as the baseline for Tatum, especially the dress. And this goes without saying, Thunder Pig is of course a big reference to Thundercats. Taking a look at last week's poll, it seems like 42% of y'all watched Omniverse when it first aired straight through to the end. And for that, I shall reward you with the unofficial symbolic award of a true Ben 10 fan. Surprisingly, the next biggest category is folks who started the series but didn't make it to the end. Which is unfortunate because, at least for me, the second half of Omniverse is where the series really hits its stride. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have 6% of folks who didn't watch it at all and refused to. And if that's true, I really hope you're not watching these breakdowns in place of the actual 
actual show. Please just go watch Omniverse. Small tangent, but I really think that if we want Ben 10 to come back, we have to find ways to support it in any way that we can. And it sucks because HBO Max just removed Omniverse in the UAF era right after I was promoting it. So it's like they're trying to doom their own show, which is nothing new when it comes to Ben 10. It's crazy to think of how popular and successful Ben 10 has become and how much Cartoon Network just absolutely shits on it. But let's not let them. There's still DVDs, you can get the episodes on YouTube and Amazon, and it was recently announced that the classic series is coming to Netflix, which hopefully means that the sequels aren't too far behind. For this week's poll, I want to ask y'all how you feel about Omniverse's style. Let's try to get all these new change discussions out of the way early so that we can just normalize the breakdowns as we go forward. So let me know what you think about Omniverse's style in the community tab when this video goes live. I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your weekend. And as always, keep it fizzy.